on my to... property. You didn't win shit in my yard. Wait, 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 I, wait, 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 wait. All of you. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fish in the DMV. We are doing a special live stream today, and we are going to be going for as long as I can basically stay alive. We're going to just keep doing this from now until uh, 4 or 5 p.m. this evening. So if you'd like to stay with us all day, good on you. You're a true warrior of the sport. If you want to just dip in and out, that's no problem, too. This will be chopped up and re-aired as a podcast version for you hard workers that are actually work during the week and you know enjoy your weekends to go fishing and maybe spend time with your family. Uh, give you kind of a, a sense of what's going on today. We are at Jake's Bait and Tackle's uh, 10 year anniversary tra- uh, extravaganza. It'll be starting here at 10 a.m. They are located in Winchester, Virginia. They're going to have a flea market. They are going to have food all day. Um, so we also will have Jason Halliker, uh, who is with the Virginia Department of Fish and Game or the DNR now, Natural Wildlife Resources. He will have a fish tank here. He'll be doing a demonstration of how he uses a shock boat and also the different types of fish that are in and around the waters of our area. So for our first guest that we're going to have today, we have Shane Flint of Shane Flint Outdoors. Uh, I had the opportunity to go work with this guy uh, or go fish with him, and it was an absolute ball. And guys, in the comment section down below, please let me know how the audio is. If I need to adjust it or anything else like that, I'll do that on my end. Um, Shane is going to be talking to us about his channel, what's going on in his neck of the woods. Uh, And without further ado, let's get him on. Shane, how are you doing today? Doing great, Thomas. How are you? So, what has been going on in your neck of the woods? Oh, uh, quite a bit. We, um, you know, the fishing kind of slowed down the, a little bit there in September as that turnover started changing. You know, the fall turnover started kicking in. But we got a big thing going on my channel, and it's a, a virtual bass tournament that uh, kicked off on Wednesday. Um, people, if you, if, if folks want to still join in, uh, I'm, op- I'm leaving it open until Wednesday and we call it the five bass draw, uh, fishing tournament. And right now we got close to 200 people across the United States that have signed up. It is, um, it's, it's a, it's a little bit different type of a tournament. It's a tournament divided into two periods, um, where folks can fish for the first period. You get a null call of three bass. you got to qualify for the first period to get the second period where, um, you you get to call out your bass um so it's five bass total um it's an exciting tournament that we got going on like i said a lot of people are very interested in it and and then so how long have you been doing these tournaments for down in that area of the country and for the people that don't know uh what area of the country are you actually fishing in yeah thanks i'm so i'm down in uh just north of fredericksburg virginia um just about 50 miles south of the dc area um i fish primarily around here in uh the, the reservoirs um, we got some great reservoirs, and Thomas, you went to two of them when you came down and fished with us. Um, just some really good reservoirs: Hunting Run Reservoir, Mooney Reservoir, uh, Nye Reservoir, um, Abel Lake is another water reservoir that is here, and Curtis Lake. Um, all within about a twenty-minute drive from my house, um, and they produce great fish. I mean, I've catching fish in the seven and eight-pound class quite often, um, and you know, lots of four and five-pound bass in this in these lakes down here pretty productive fishery. Yeah. And then when we were there, it was really that, that mid summertime, like doldrum. And it was, it was a heck of a day. And guys, I actually did take a GoPro down there to, to, to actually document the day. And then my battery ran out by the time that we started catching them. So I caught two fish on camera and that was it. And then it's when all, the Pandora's box was open and we kind of figured out something. So hopefully Shane, uh, I, I did listen into his live stream the other day. He does have footage. So, um, go to his channel, please like, and subscribe to his channel too. Uh, cause you can watch that whole video. It was really, really epic of a day out there on, on a hunting run. Um, and, and that's usually a, a hard time of year to fish that area, unless you know, you have pan optics. When will those lakes start really heating up in the, in the coming days and months? I, I think, you know, with this cold front that moved through, um, uh, yesterday, um, I think probably in the next seven to 10 days, it'll start heating up pretty good because the temperatures are already dropping. Um, last year, the first week of October was is when it just turned on. Um, and when I started f- catching fish, they started my you know transitioning in the back of the coves. The bait fish started moving. As a matter of fact, somebody sent me a screenshot off their pan optics yesterday 
and the bait fish were starting to stack up back in the coves. Oh, wow. Uh, in, in Lake Mooney. Um, and just, it looked, you could not only see the water, the bait fish was so, so thick. So it's starting to transition. Um, I, I would say the 1st of October through the middle of November, it is just hot fishing down here. Um, and not only do you get numbers, that's when you start catching the big fish again as well. Um, okay. it's, it's a good time of year to be out there on the water. Yeah. And, and guys, this was like my first time actually going down there. Um, I, I talked to Shane and also, and, Mar and Mar uh, Marty, he's going to be coming on a little bit later too, uh, on the program, but I've heard of all these lakes down there. I've seen YouTubers fish them and going down there. It is an absolute angler's paradise. I see why there's so many great sticks down there and it's very unique because it's primarily all electric motor only lakes. And when you, when you hear that, you, would, you, would, you, you have certain mindset of like what you're going to be dealing with maybe like a very small lake that's highly pressured. And at least from what I saw, there's a huge variety of lakes. And it's so cool because if you get one of these pimped out boats like 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 Shane has, you can fish a, a dirty, weedy lake. You can fish a highly pressured, clear lake. You can figure out in his section of the country how to fish a couple of lakes. You can take that information, that skill, and that knowledge, and you can transfer it to all over the country. Shane, is that about right? Oh, that is absolutely true. Basically, you're, you know, the way these lakes are, you know, set up, they're all a little bit different. Um, and you've got to learn those lakes, but you're, you're correct. You can take what you learn from fishing these three and 400, 500 acre uh, reservoirs. And if you're fishing a bigger giant lake, you can just think about when you get all those bigger lakes, how you fish a three to 400 uh, acre section of that lake and catch fish. It's, it's a, it's a good way to, to learn patterns because you get everything from points to weeds to rip rafts to everything that you're going to find in a giant lake in a smaller venue that you can then take that knowledge and transfer for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good deal. Now, what kind of boat are you running? So I have a, a 16 foot low, uh, it's called the, it's a 16, 60 inches wide called the low rough neck. Um, and it's got a front deck on it. Um, I've built this out a couple of years ago, um, actually in 2020, um, or no, 2021 is when I built it right when COVID was going on. And it's all electric. Um, everything, like you said, the reservoirs are down here, all electric. I decided instead of going to a bass boat, um, I decided I'm going to fish the reservoirs because it's, it's fun and it's, it's good, you know, good fishing. So I, uh, I have two trolling motors on my boat. Uh, of course, a front uh, mounted trolling motor foot controlled. And then the back, currently I run a 36 volt uh, trolling motor in the back. And I, you know, run five and a half miles per hour. Uh, when that 36 volt uh, is running in the back. So it pushes the boat around pretty well. Um, and, you know, I'm going to transition um, later this spring, probably going to a 48 volt motor in the back. But I uh, have all the electronics that you have on a normal bass boat, uh, including pan optics, um, uh, depth finder in the back. Uh, you know, I have, it's basically all the luxury you get in a mm -hmm. luxury, all the capability you have from a regular bass boat I packed into this 1660 uh, low roughneck and it's, it's a, it's a great fishing machine. You were on it. Uh, oh, dude, room. it's fantastic. Yeah. It's plenty of room and, and you can fish, um, all day long. I have never, uh, drained a battery. I know we had the back trolling motor go out. It was a fuse. I've come to find out. Um, that was my backup motor. Oh, that's what that was. Okay. Thank goodness. Yeah, I was like, I was... but, um, that was my backup motor. I didn't even have the 36 volt because I had to uh, have a problem with it. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, I, you can fish all day and I've never, I think maybe drain my batteries to 50%. That's, that's really 50%. Yeah. yeah. So, so then at this time of year, let me pull, pull this up on here. Just, just to give the viewers an, an idea, what are you looking for? And, and you can pick any lake and I, I can get us to there. What are you looking for as we transition to this fall time of year? So the first thing I look for is I want to know where water sources are coming into a lake. So this is Mooney. It looks like, right? Is that yeah. What you yeah, so this is Lake Mooney. Um, and there's three creeks that feed into Lake Mooney. And, and you can see there's actually three arms on the lake if you scan out. Um, so one, the two northern pointing, and then there's one that's north, uh, northeast pointing. Those are actually water feeds into the lake. So for some reason, I feel like the bass try to, they, they go, they gravitate, gravitate back to where the water source is coming into the lake in the fall. And so do the bait fish. So I try to go in the back ends of those coves. I'll start back in that area. I'm pointing at it like it's on my screen, but um, that's what I—that's where I target first. 
Okay. And I'll, if, you know, and then I go into some of these and work my way back and work into some of these other codes that you see up, up, the, up the fingers there. What, what is the primary forage that you're dealing with in these lakes? Is it blueback herring? Is it shad? Is it bluegill? Is it shiners? What do you usually see? Um, so it's a combination. Um, and Mooney has this lake. It has, a, is it the IU? Is that the, is that a, the, the name, how they pronounce that? Um, it's a yeah. shad. Ly, thank you. That's what I'm thinking. Ly, heavy, um, and I think that you know that has made that lake. The bass are just monstrous in that for the age of the lake. The lake's only ten years old, um, and we're catching seven and eight pound bass out of that lake. So <laughs> that is the forge in that lake, and it's heavy. Um, like an Able Lake, um, we don't have. It's all bluegill. It's you know that lake is 60, 65, 70 years old, and it's all bluegill. And panfish is the primary forage. And I, I think I mentioned this to you, and I'll mention it here. I think that's a lake, um, and that's just a little bit north of Mooney there. But I think that's a lake that's got a state record in it right now. Um, and a lot of people don't fish it. Um, there you can sit right over there north up by the plus mark. Uh, the other ooh. way. That long, that's Abel Lake right there. And very hard to fish because of the way it's constructed. But um, the way the way the lake runs, it's a three mile long, small, skinny lake. But it's got big bass in it. But and what did you what did you, what did you say the primary? I, I sorry to cut you off. What did you say the primary forage is in this one? Panfish. Really? Yes. There, That's it, it has white perch, crappie, and and um, you know bluegill is the primary forage in that lake. Uh, and like I said, the lake is really old. But um, and it doesn't get a lot of pressure because it's an electric only lake and it's three miles long. Wow. So you can't if you don't if you just have a regular 12 volt uh, battery and they warn you this on the DMV website, you're not going to make it all the way in and back on one battery. So you're going to have a boat that's set up to do that. Um, but that's one of the you know, that's one of the good lakes up here. And, you know, panfish, you know, just the natural forage is what you have in that lake. Um, down on Hunting Run, Golden Shiner is what they have. They stocked that lake with Golden Shiner, which is that's Hunting Run right there. Um, and and it's that lake is is starting to I think it's popular. It's a lot of fishing pressure, uh, but I'm still catching consistently. I mean, you caught a five pound bass out of there. Mm -hmm. I'm still consistently catching four to seven pound bass in Hunting Run. Um, it, and on any given, especially this spring, I think. In a six-week, seven-week period this spring, I caught 10 to 15 bass, don't know the number that were in that six to seven-pound range. And, and what's really crazy, guys, about, about this fishery, too, and what I really love about this Frederick area is there's so many lakes, and again, a hypothesis I've had about why we need to start building lakes, opening up more water, is it spreads out the anglers. And so it was funny that I went to Mooney on a, on a Saturday afternoon, and there was like three boats on that big place it, it didn't feel like it was like crowded at all and then you go to hunting run and then it, it's funny because in the morning there's like a line and it, it, honestly it was so cool because i've heard stories about this in california where you would have these lakes that would open up at like 7 a.m and there was probably a state a world record in there and so you'd have a line to be like the first boat on the water and there's a blast off like a tournament it was so freaking cool and, and then you get there and once everyone kind of gets sprawled out it, it, it there's boats yeah but it's not like um the potomac river on a saturday during the bfl season it's nothing like that and i think what also helps it is because it's electric only you don't have those massive wakes you don't have all those wake borders you don't have people just out there on jet skis and so when you just have purely anglers and maybe a couple of powder board, paddle borders it's amazing how big it fishes and i truly think after going down with you i thought about this like yeah that's why lake anna and deep creek feel so crazy is it's not because of the fishing pressure it's also because of all the pleasure boaters too yeah absolutely yeah it's, it's nice just to have fishing boats on the lake it does make a difference you experience it there at Hunting Run, though. On any given morning, you can have a lot of boats um, mm -hmm. out there. I, and I think there were probably 20 to 30 boats on the lake that day. Easily. Yeah. Easily, yeah. It was crazy. Uh, and we still caught fish. I, uh, we caught, what, 15, 20 total um, at least. But mm -hmm. uh, And by the way, I'll have that footage out here pretty soon. I don't have it out yet. I'm still so backed up on, on, on footage, but it'll probably be out in the next week or two. Dude, no, I trust me. I, I feel you. I have a couple of fishing videos I've been working on since ICAST. And it's so like, and again, like I also have the podcast. I got to make sure I always pimp out too, but it's hard. It's really hard to try to edit and shoot and everything. And you really appreciate, you know, 
guys, if you don't have a YouTube channel or you don't create content, just saying a nice compliment is insanely, it's so valuable. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like working retail, I almost say, that just having a nice thank you for doing this. Oh my goodness, it goes because you put so much work into this for basically free content, you know, free learning. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a little controversy over my channel with the flatheads and stuff, and which is perfectly fine. People are allowed to voice their opinions. But then when you get those comments, like, hey, you know, thanks for just even doing this. Like, all right, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That's really nice. Yeah. Um, but no, guys. And, and again, that, well, I'm at Jake's Bait and Tackle all day. We're celebrating the 10 year anniversary of Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If you guys have questions, please message me. There's a live chat. I'll be going all day. I'm going to try to get them answered. Doesn't matter what. The best questions will be winning prizes. Also, if you're here and you ask a question, you'll be going home with something too as well. Um, one thing I kind of wanted to get into was was the bait size, honestly, because this was something that came up when we were doing panoptics, and this is what stuck out in my mind amazingly. Um, so I, I used to have, I used to use panoptics a little bit, and then I, I sold it off my boat. I'm getting, I'm getting the new one eventually. Um, but when we were at the lake and we were using it. It was seeing the little details and figuring out what they were. And the, and the two things that pop out to me is we always saw what we thought were fish streaking to the surface. And then it finally clicked on us like, no, those are air bubbles. Like, yeah. that's, it, it was in, insane to me, yeah. like, just figuring that out. Because we kept, I kept casting to him. I was like, what the heck is this? Uh, yeah. And the second was every little fish we saw rush to our bait. We assumed, you know what? That's probably a bluegill. It's a crappie. It's something else. And they, we kept having these fish sh like shark or baits. And so eventually I was like, you know what? Maybe it's a crappie. Like you said, that'd be fun. I want to live scope some crappie. Guys, I went down to a little trout magnet. Bass, bass, bass. It was insane that all those little darters we were probably seeing were bass the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So there were eight to ten. A lot of those smaller ones were eight to ten inch bass. Um and we actually, I've learned a lot from just that experience now that I, I can actually pick out um, on panoptics and I'll move past those little schools of tiny bass now. Um, and I learned to see the, the difference in size mm -hmm. there, but it's true that you, you can't discount and go, oh, that's just bluegill. Oh, that's just that. It may be, it's probably bass. Yeah, it if might be bass. Made, it's probably a bass. And that shows you the health of that lake too yeah. now. Yeah. Cause like my mind was blown driving up like, okay, so how many bass actually saw our bait? Because like going back, I was like, oh, it's perch or crappie like you said. But now it's like, oh my God, there's a lot of bass in that lake. It's insane. Yes. Yes. It, that lake, that, uh, they're on hunting run. I, I'm, they took off the, it did have a slot limit. It was a trophy. It was considered a trophy bass lake. They had the slot limit on it. And they took it off because the, we're starting to get, a little overpopulation in that lake and you know you got to have a healthy takeout rate and a lot of people don't like to keep bass mm -hmm. um but there's there's a need to take some of the bass out of the lake where we don't get that um overcrowding you know where the bass where there's not enough forage for all the bass um so it, you know i encourage folks if you go out there to hunting running you do eat bass just don't catch them to catch them um take 5 12 13 14 inch or something like that to help that lake um get a keep a good healthy trophy population of bass mm -hmm. um, it's and, and you've seen it there's a lot a lot of fish in that place there's there's a lot and and, and something else guys uh, i want to make sure i key on this this point is understand the size of the bait that they're targeting and how important that is especially going into the fall so when we were seeing bait balls on there i i, I still for the life of me to this day do not understand size uh, on panoptics quite yet but when I went down to those little, that, that little like inch, half inch micro jig, and I started to catch them, what clicked to me was how big are these bait balls? Because what it could also be a lot of times, and, and you see this in summertime tournaments when they're keying on the young, the young of the year, they're going in there and they're just vacuuming up these little minnows. And then you're throwing a, a, a two inch kai tech thing like, oh, I'm small enough. And then it's like, no, I don't, I don't think we are sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So... I've got some, here's some examples. This Go way. for it. This is a seven, <laughs> inch, this is seven eight inch Kitech. I think it's an eight inch Kitech. You were throwing a large bait like this, mm -hmm. wasn't getting any bites. This is the size I was throwing, which is a five inch Kitech, and I was tearing them up. Mm -hmm. right? This was probably the size of the forge that they were, they were after versus this larger forge. I think this larger forge here, now that fall's coming in will be something that I'll be targeting. I'll be going to a larger size in the fall and probably catch larger bass, but I will also have this five inch right by my side ready if I'm not picking them up on the big ones. But 
that day you had that larger swim bait that was this, you know, maybe a little bit bigger than this, but this was the size they were keying on this five inch uh, Kitek, easy shiner. Um, and I, you, you got to match the hatch a lot of times, especially when the bite's slow. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a little slow that day. Now, when it's when the bite's a little hot, you can get away. You're going to get those bass jumping on something a little bigger uh, because they're hungry. Um, but I think it's key. Try to match the hatches as, as, as much as possible size wise. You know, no, you can, uh-huh. you can have a debate about color all day long and all that good stuff. But the size, what they're used to seeing and eating, I think, is the trigger mechanism that'll that'll re, that'll get them out there and, and get get them on the hook for you. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's what's just so unique to me, or so unique into that situation, is the fact that bass will target minnows. They will target fry, and I think they probably eat snakehead fry when that's abundant. Like they're very opportunistic. And now it, visualizing it, what's so crazy to me is the fact that. You, you could see a bass going up to a school of minnows that size and they're just, they're vacuuming them up. And yes. then it, if they're keyed in on that, you're not going to catch them. And you're going to think that, okay, possibly this is not bass. Keep little crappie jigs, keep them in your boat guys, especially like that's what blew my mind was like how important it is and why crappie fishermen every now and then would catch big bass. Because if they're keying in on those minnows, you're not going to catch them with a five inch Kitek or something like that. So e- right. even though, you know, as bass heads, you know, I love to throw the mag draft. I love to throw the big swim baits, you know, don't be afraid to keep that little tiny stuff in there. Cause it's not necessarily finesse. It's because of what they're keying in on size wise. Right. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned this to you in the boat. I think a great little lure like that to keep in your boat is the old Roadrunner. Old Roadrunner jig, little spinhead, mm-hmm. marabou um, Roadrunner. You can get them in one inch to three inch. Um, great little bait when they're when they're uh, swimming around, when they're sucking up those one and two inch uh, uh, minnows. I mean, that, mm-hmm. it, they can key on that, and it looks very similar. It's got a little flash. So a good little bait to keep in the boat. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, with that said, as we're going into fall, um, and if you want a minute or two to, to grab some stuff, you want to show us some baits, like your top five baits this time of year? Yeah, I got something right behind me, actually. This Perfect. Yeah. So, let me, give me a second here, and I'll, I'll have them out. And then I'm going to be answering some questions here in the in, in the chat. We got one here. Uh, we got Hidden Hollow Loft. What does DMV stand for? So if you grew up in D.C. like I did, I actually grew up in Fairfax, Virginia, right right near the Beltway. DMV stands for D.C., Maryland, Virginia. So as a D.C. person, a nickname for the area is called the DMV because it's, it's the greater metropolitan area of, of D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. And so it used to be just the Beltway inside and outside the Beltway that call, call, they call that area. But now that, you know, Loudoun County is considered part, really part of the DMV now because it's, it's blown up so much and people are traveling in for work. Frederick, uh, Fredericksburg area, I'm, I'm thinking is now soon to be called the DMV part of it too because people are tra- people are living there and then still driving to DC, which is crazy. And so that's why I named the channel that because we are anglers that will travel more than any other ones on the planet. Um, when I would fish college tournaments um, and you go to like national championships and stuff and guys from Alabama would be like, yeah, we can fish the BFLs within 15 minutes of our house for four lakes. And I'm like, dude, I got to burn like uh, a lot of gas to travel for, like four hours to fish a local tournament because you might have to fish Kerr and then Smith and then the Potomac and that's her local like rotation and so as, as DMV area people we're just so used to traveling everywhere and that's why we cover such a big area um but but back on topic I see we got Sh- Shane back with some baits here yeah so I you know there's there's quite a few different techniques you can use in the fall to catch fish but you most people realize that this time of year um it's going to be when the bass are piling up and, and getting fat it's something fast something that's got flash or something that can grab their attention quick and i really love topwater fishing and i think this time of year if you can get out there with this is a rebel pop bar mm-hmm. uh, this is a p71 model which is the larger pop bar not the super pop bar that they sell the smaller one um, this is a really good especially in the morning um, and in the shady areas uh, and in the middle of the day you get drive a lot of bites on this it drives them crazy i get uh, you know, I'll kind of walk the dog and, and use the popper at the same time. Really good bait uh, in the fall, um, especially in the morning. And you can, you can, you know, this time of year, you can fish topwater all, all day long and be pretty productive. 
but this is this is what I usually start with in the morning. But my my favorite standby um, this time of year is a spinnerbait. This is a Molex short arm spinnerbait, but lots of flash. Um, again, match the hatch with the skirt. This is a golden shiner. This is the color that I use out on uh, hunting run. Um, I catch a lot of big bass uh, in the fall on the spinnerbait. I just you have to you have to. I have to keep that tied on all the time because if you get a little bit of wind that this you can catch a lot of fish on a spinnerbait I, I would tell you though if it's not windy don't try it um and then another bait this is just a tried and true just the lipless crankbait in the fall when they're stacked up in the in the back of the coves and the baits back there a lipless crankbait um, i'm gonna have tied on one of my uh one of my rods no doubt uh, the magic with this is you can fish this as shallow as deep or you can jig it depending on what the depth of the back of the cove or the area the bait fish are in, this gives you a lot of versatility um, to catch uh, fish at different depths. Um, and when they're really biting, you can catch a lot of fish um, on the uh, lipless crankbait. And, you know, that's that's one other one. Um, I can't, you know, along on the top water side, the buzz bait is big in the fall too. Um, if, if it's just a tiny little bit of wind or, or it's calm, I love fishing the buzz bait too in the, in the fall. It's just a really good producer. Um, so th those are the four baits. And, and of course, short bill, you, you know, you can't go wrong with the, uh, the uh, shallow ride, shallow uh, crank bait, um, square bill. Um, that, that's a good bait as well. I would say those are the primary baits that I kind of target. Talk, talk a little bit more about the spinner bait. What is your perfect spinner bait setup when it comes to color and blade combinations? Um, so I really fell in love with these Molex short arm spinner bait um, this, this uh, last spring. But then primarily because I like a giant blade on my spinner baits. And this is a 5.5 willow leaf spinner blade. Uh, uh, blade. Um, I think flash is important in vibration with the spinner bait. Um, so I think this is a really good uh, combination, the way this blade sets up on here. But I would tell you, primarily, most of the fish I caught with the spinner bait, I like a Colorado. I've got one right behind me. Uh, a Colorado, mega. Um, I like a double blade Colorado uh, willow, typically not this, not the uh, double willow, but a Colorado small blade and a big um, willow leaf blade on a white and chartreuse with a white trailer or chartreuse trailer. I think it's just you can't go wrong with that color. That's a good standard color. That's a good standard. Um, you get the. You get the flash, a lot of flash with the willow leaf, and you get that thump with the Colorado blade, which I think is important um, to, to kind of give it, you know, a, a good vibration. Because um, that's the things that I think the two things that are key with the spinnerbait: flash, vibration, and then they get the visual. The third thing is they get the visual of what it looks to be a bait fish. So I think uh, Colorado willow is my favorite setup. Uh, chartreuse and white skirt with a wider chartreuse. I like the curly tail trailers. I mean, that's old school to me, but it doesn't really matter whatever you're comfortable with on a trailer. What are your thoughts on a trailer hook? And guys, you know, let me in the comment section below, let me know, are you for a trailer hook or are you against a trailer hook? Because I kind of have a mixed message. I want to get your opinion first. I, I don't use trailer hook. I'm, I'm against a trailer hook. Um, Why? Because if, uh, if you are catching the bass and they're hitting the trailer hook, you probably got the wrong bait. Um, you need to think about fishing something else. Um, if they're hitting short and you've got to put a, a, a trailer hook on to get the bite, probably think 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 about another a different bait. I when I when they are biting a spinner bait, they engulf the spinner bait, and no need for a trailer hook. The other thing is is the trailer hook. You get a lot of stray hooks. You get them in their eyes, um, and it's you know if they're hitting that primary hook, there's no reason to have the trailer. Um, and you know it, it is that you know. It's, whatever you prefer. Um, but I, when they're, when I'm catching on a spinnerbait, I, the only thing that's sticking out of their mouth when they bite is this part. They engulf the whole spinnerbait. So. I, I think, so I've told this story a thousand times. My brother and I were fishing a regional tournament on the Chesapeake, upper Chesapeake. And we went through this new, new, new area of grass that we have never fished before. And we had, we had things nipping our chatterbait and our, and our spinnerbait. Um, we didn't know what they were. And we assumed like, you know what? They're probably perch because we were catching a bunch of perch without a problem. And we went through that grass bed one time and nothing, 
And so my brother was like, you know what? Let's go through it one more time. And he pulled out a travel, a trailer hook out of his thing, put it in there. Third cast, four and a half pounder. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and just, that's why I think that's just so important to do is, is keep them. We just lost your audio, Tom. Oh, sorry about that. So, yeah. yeah. So what I'm, what I'm thinking is keep a trailer hook, keep it there. If you're getting short striked and you just have that gut feeling, throw it on there and then just take it yeah. off regular, regular time. Cause it, it, again, you just don't want to kind of, you never know. Um, and especially if you're fishing really grassy fisheries, like we have up here, the Potomac river, the upper Bay, upper Bay. Um, I, I don't even, I don't throw it on a swim jig, but every now and then I will put it on there just to make sure what am I getting bit on? Cause again, without pan optics or something like that, you don't know. And that's something that yeah. opened my eyes when I was with you is I thought they weren't bass until I did. And that changes now my strategy. Keep a tra trailer hook with you. And then if it is a perch, fine. You, you now know what those short strikes are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not totally opposed of it. I just typically, um, if I'm getting them, if they're biting on the spinnerbait, they're biting on the spinnerbait. But that's a good a good approach is to, to keep, keep one of them tackle box for sure. So go, going into this time of year, what lakes do you think are going to be the hottest? Like, is it going to be all of them that are going to turn on? Do they all turn on at the same time or do they turn on at different times? Yeah, uh, so that they usually turn on about the same. Of course, each lake is a little bit different because of water clarity and things of that nature. It's kind of the same thing in the, in the spring when, when lakes warm up. The darker stained lakes get a little bit more heat faster um, than the clearer lakes. But um, I think they're within a week or so of each other uh, turning on. Uh, and I think that all depends on a couple of things you got to consider is um, how much precipitation we're getting. If there's water coming into the creeks from the creek system um, if, and if it's dry. Um, so those are a couple of factors. But um, all of the lakes down here are usually, you know, really hot come the first of October. Now, the, very uh, honestly here, I didn't fish Mooney that much last year in the fall. Um, this will be the first year I fish it heavy in the fall. So um, I'm not sure on that lake, but based on the, uh, the information I got yesterday from one of the guys that fish out there a lot, um, they're already, they're already turning on just like we expect. So that's freaking I think awesome. all of them will be good. Yeah, that, yeah. That's freaking awesome. And, and then one, one thing you did mention earlier was like swim baits do really come into play. Um, could you walk us through your, like your setup for, for the popper and, and for the swim bait specifically? Like, are you using, let's just start with the popper, I guess. Are you using old school, just braid? Are you using monofilament? What is your best top water setup? Uh, so uh, I fished with a heavy uh, halo HFX rod, seven foot 11 um, with the Daiwa Taxa C100 reel um, with 30 pound braid. Uh, the braid, I, you don't have to have braid for top water, but the, the braid floats. And if you are fishing around heavy vegetation and you get a big one in there, that braid cuts through the vegetation and allows you to pull a big bass out. So that's how I have my setup for my top water, uh, heavy action. And just the other day, um, I was fishing in a top water tournament actually that I won. I boat flipped almost a six pound bass, um, with that, with that setup. It, mainly because my, my net was hung up in a boat and I needed to get that fish in a boat. But with that heavy rod and that 30 pound test line, if you had to do something like that, especially when your drilling's gone from top water fishing, it gives you a little bit more flexibility to, to boat flip a, a bass into the boat. Um, now on my top, on my uh, swim bait, a little bit different for setup, I'm going to fish a spinning reel. I like to fish a spinning reel uh, with a medium action rod. I got a Halo Edge FX uh, medium rod with the dial attached to the reel, uh, 2000 series size reel um, on 10 pound um, Yozuri uh, fluorocarbon is what I like to, to fish my, uh, my swim bait with. Now, when I go to this big swim bait, medium heavy action, I'm going to be doing back to bait casting um, with, the, with the owner brute hook weighted hook on that so that, that's that's the two setups that i have now have you ever thought about throwing those mag drafts or those, or those even bigger bigger donkey ones <laughs> I, I have and thomas that's why i, I bought these after fishing with you. These are I, i'm going to try this i think this winter this is going to be a money maker this winter as well but i am going to throw this bigger and i'm going to throw this on 16 to 20 pound test line at fluorocarbon. And guys, I was, I'm just thinking now what we might do is we might do another live stream with, with Shane and I, and we'll actually go through, uh, we'll have him share the footage and we could go through it talking about the day uh, to give a little bit more insight to it because I started throwing that, that mag draft to watch it on Panoptics and it was insane 
the draw factor and how you can use uh, forward facing sonar to really search an area without even like catching one or seeing it on the surface. Cause he would throw his swim bait, he'd right. get one or two draws. And I'd throw this big, like, you know, 13 inch bait out there. And all of a sudden the graph would just light up. And it's just so interesting, like how that can be used as possibly a search tool in pre fishing. And you don't necessarily have to catch anything. Yeah, that's right. And what was interesting is, you know, it did draw a lot of fish. But when we finally try, and I'll use the word snipe a bass, which I think that's a yeah. fair assumption yeah. of what we did with the big one you caught. You caught it on a small search bait. That bigger bass caught, I think it was what, a four, five inch uh, uh, search bait mm -hmm. uh, is what we the bass was interested in. So it was, uh, we, I learned a lot from that, just that fishing trip on how you can draw the fish in. And then when we actually caught the big one, it was on a smaller bait. It, um, it's so crazy isn't it like like how yeah. that worked where yeah like um and guys so when the video dropped so i we were fishing this bait ball and i finally i kept changing baits because that's just what i do i got a problem with that and i finally switched to a spy bait and i and i pulled it through the school of, of bait and then all of a sudden i saw one race up to it and follow it for a little bit and then lost interest and then what i did is i opened the bale and let the spy bait do its shimmy all the way down to the bottom and he nosed it down to the bottom and then when i popped it you know, that's where, where when, when magic happened, but, but the, it, but it was so interesting is like, he wanted that smaller bait and he wanted it to fall through. And I think that's why like a mag draft spoon, you know, is so deadly or any type of spoon is so deadly on those fish when they're schooling on bait. Yeah. Yeah. And we were lucky. We, we did find a lot of bait balls that day, um, it, which makes it easier. We know the bass are going to be around the bait fish. So it makes it easier, to, especially with panopic to target fish. Um, and, and they, the bite was a little slow that day, but it's still, we were able to, to, you know, get some, get, get some good bites for sure. What, what is your, uh, finesse setup, your go-to finesse setup this time of year? Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, my finesse setup in the fall is, is not much different than, um, what I do in midsummer. Um, I like if I'm around and I'll use Lake Mooney, for example, because it has a lot of vegetation. And it's really a deep lake and you know people use cinco's and things of that nature and wacky worm around the edges i like to use a six or seven inch culprit the the auger tail is what i call worm weightless and i just like to let it drop around the weed edges around timber um, on a 10 pound test line medium medium rod um and maybe a medium heavy and with a bait caster and that's what i, I just like to let it flutter down and just kind of it, for a better lack of term dead stick all the way down the bottom and let the natural tail do the, the do the work and i find that to be effective in the summer and even in the fall mm -hmm. i think it's, it's really effective in the fall as well uh, when, when um and some of these lakes do any of these lakes actually shut down in, in the fall or in the winter Absolutely. time yeah so hunting run closes uh columbus day Columbus weekend is the last weekend that it is uh, open. It closes until the mid March. So it's closed from October to March. Okay. So, got gotcha. it. Yeah. That really helps that fishery too, because last year um, on opening day, I went out there and just, it just, I, I think I caught 35 bass and I caught probably 10 over three and two over five on, on opening day. Wow. Uh, it was amazing. <laughs> And it was 39 degrees that morning. Um, so, yeah, when that lake, I think it really helps to shut that lake down. Now, it takes away one lake I can fish all year. Um, and Nye Reservoir, by the way, Nye does the same thing. It, it, it closes down on um, the same time frame. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And then, guys, for if you're just tuning in, um, we are celebrating Jake Bait and Tackle's 10 year anniversary located in Winchester, Virginia. We have a massive event that starts at 10 a.m. and goes till 4 p.m. today. So, we're going to be here all day. People are just showing up, uh, people are still setting up. We're going to have Torquito here. We're going to have Jeff Little. We, he's been on the show. He's a fantastic uh, kayak fisherman. Uh, we're going to have Jason, who's part of the Department of Wildlife Resources. He's going to be having a fish tank explaining the different species that live here. He's also going to have a shock boat and i'm going to try to have guests all day i'm going to get all your questions answered before i leave so please if you uh ask a good question or ask any question honestly in the comment section i'm going to try to get you a prize and then if you actually show up here today any kids that show up here today you're going to go away with a prize as well so uh please keep them coming and please like and subscribe to the channel um what shane what is going on with, with your channel right now is there anything new that you're going to be having in the works uh, <clears throat> no as i spoke talked about earlier kind of got off is you know the tournament that we have going on 
Um, that kicked off on the 21st. Um, it's not too late to sign up if you want to, but I'm going to cut that off on Sunday. But th that tournament is going to last six weeks, so that's going to be – and honestly, I did not expect to have close to 200 people in this tournament. Good. That's pretty good. It, it, it's pretty It's pretty good uh, numbers, but it's put, it added a lot of work to me from an administrative aspect, but it's, it, that's great. Um, that's the growth part. Uh, but throughout the – Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, continue, sir. Sorry. Yeah. But um, actually, this winter, uh, coming into late fall, I start a series on my channel called Chatter Day. Um, I'm sorry, Chatter Chatter Talk. Chatter. Where I just, yeah, where I just interview fishermen, um, YouTube fishermen, and from across the United States. And I'm going to continue that this winter. Um, we did a lot of folks from Ohio, Michigan, um, Texas last year, Florida. And I'm going to try to continue that on. I'll probably do 10 to 12 interviews throughout the winter. When the fishing gets slow, uh, people still like to think about fishing and talk about fishing. So instead of being out trying to catch fish and uh, and stay warm, um, I'll, I'll switch that over to these interviews. And, and they were pretty popular last winter. I just started them. Um, so that, that'll, be, that'll be coming late in the fall, early in the winter. What? got you into doing these tournaments like what was your inspiration because uh, guys if you don't know a tournament director's life is never fun no matter who it is no matter what you think of them it's very stressful and it's a lot so what what made you want to do that so thomas did, you know i looked and i permanent fish um, a lot when i was younger and and loved it um but you're right it it's they are usually hard to put together and it's it's pretty stressful right when you get out there on the lake and you put your money down and, and you know, you're on you put everything on the line to try to catch fish. But what I see is a gap. Um, and, you know, you get pro fishing uh, tournaments and then local tournaments, but there's no way for competitive people to compete across the United States on their own water if they got a kayak, if they got a bass boat, or if they got a John boat, or if they just fish from the bank. So I think, you know, I, I see that, that uh, gap in, in competition there. And so that's why I put these tournaments together to give everybody an opportunity. They're all free. Um, all these are free. I don't have I don't have a sponsor yet, but I'm working on some sponsorship. Hopefully in the near future. Nice. But these are free. Just to, you know, you've got a chance to compete against anyone. They're virtual. You can go to your home lakes, your home pond, whatever, and compete. Um, and, it, and it adds a little bit of fun to getting out and fishing every day, and drives people out to to fish. Um, and and it's the way the tournaments are set up. Um, it's fun for everybody and competitive as well. And I, I think it's there's some future in that, and I'm going to keep pressing uh, to put these free tournaments out for everybody to fish in. Now, do you see this like taking over at some point and, and growing outside of your area? Is that like the overall plan, hopefully? Uh, right now, this tournament, Thomas, I have 41 states represented in this tournament. 41 states are represented in this tournament. It has grown way outside. This is a complete virtual tournament. So That's this is pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, a lot of lot of interest, um, a lot of interest of folks. Um, and some people, some people are doing this. This is their first time competing in a fishing tournament. Really? And I, yes, and I want to keep it fun, right? So I, I put little prizes out there. If you catch you catch your PB a twenty five inch bass, I'm going to give you some type of reward. You know, if it's just a forty dollar gift card from a tackle warehouse or something like that. But yeah, I want to keep it fun. Um, and if you're an amateur, if you're a bank fisherman, or if you're a professional bass fisherman, if you will, probably no pros are going to fish in these things, but, um, it gives an opportunity for them to be competitive. And I would like to grow this nationwide. Um, and it, it is really nationwide in this tournament now, but I want to grow it out where next spring we can get into maybe a thousand people. competing. Wow. That, that would be really awesome. And guys, again, uh, li link in the episode description. I'll, I'll put that there. But again, if you want more information, um, where, where can they find that? Uh, go to Shane Flynn Outdoors on YouTube. There's a video on this tournament. And you can see the results of all my tournaments. So I put all the results out there on, in episodes. Uh, Shane Flynn Outdoors on YouTube or Shane Flynn Outdoors at, on Facebook. Um, and all that information is out there. And uh, you can see I put out weekly episodes uh, and, you know, and also do the tournaments. Awesome. Awesome. And then guys, we do have a couple of questions and you know, this is actually a good one that just came in. And again, guys, if you want to get a question answered, if you're here at Jake's bait and tackle and you're really afraid to, to ask me in person, don't worry, just hop on the live stream and just type it in and I'll still count that like you were here in person and you'll walk away with a prize. Same thing. Uh, if anybody, 
ask a question on the live stream. I'm going to try to get you a prize. And this might be a prize winner right here. We got Larry H something, something, you know who you are. Uh, fishing Beaver Dam, Beaver Dam in Ashburn. Why is September such a hard time of year to catch fish? Um, that's actually a really good question. Um, Shane, you want to start with that one? Yeah. So the water turnover, um, is it, that's what happens. So, you know, the thermocline changes and the waters, the lakes here, when the temperature starts to drop, and you get the heat of summer, you get the thermocline shift in the lakes. And when that shift is going on, uh, the bass are kind of in that, you know, do, am I active or not? Um, and if you, if you don't know where your thermocline is in your lake, if you have electronics in your boat, you turn up the contrast, you can see it um, on the lake. And you'll see there is a, a, a shaded area on your graph and then the top part of the water is clear and then the bottom part of the lake down towards the bottom is clear as well so the bass are trying to figure out how to transition from you know the deep water that they've been out in the summer to a shallow pattern but the thermocline and the oxygen levels um is switching over and that's what causes the fish to be a little sluggish in september yeah i mean i mean you couldn't say it better myself it, it's it's really hard with that thermocline um and, and, and it, i think the hardest part of this transition is knowing when and being able to yeah. stay on top of it so we all know once the fishing starts sucking and the fish start moving it's really getting on top of that and i've read some interesting literature about like it, it's really about the light and and not as much about the cold in the day uh shane i think i think even you mentioned maybe it's like the colder evenings too that that'll do it as well uh, and i think it depends on what type of fishery you are how how much it affects it so if it's a very grassy lake and that's the predominant cover i think you're going to be sorry but you're pretty screwed for a while because when that grass starts dying they move um yep. and we actually uh, interviewed uh steve captain steve chaconis last night that's going to drop in a couple of weeks and he talked about like yeah lake, lakes in the fall are the hardest thing if you're fishing a tidal river system or any rivers at all this is like one of the best times to get in there because it just doesn't affect those areas as much. And then, guys, if you agree or disagree, let me know in the comment section down below. Do you think lakes are the hardest thing in the fall? Do you think tidal rivers are? I think rivers really are where you need to like put your, if you could pick right now when the turnover happens, go to your creeks, go to your rivers. You're going to have a lot more success there. Yeah, I agree. I would definitely agree because the oxygen level in the water is moving. It's, it's and you, lakes aren't stagnant, but they don't have that water flow like a re river or a creek does. Yeah. That, that, that's a good that's a good point Thomas. When, when that happens in your area i mean let's just use like hunting for an example like how long does that last there is it like a week is it two weeks that you're gonna be like i'm just not gonna go out and fish or or how long it's a one to three weeks so this year is about two, two this summer and, and i haven't been in fishing the last week and a half but <clears throat> i noticed it starting in the first of september this year and um it it was probably a good two and a half three weeks you know, it, it's not just one week. It's not one day. It can last one, one to one to four weeks. It could be a month. Last year, I didn't catch a fish hardly on Able Lake the whole month of September. And I fished that heavy. I mean, I caught a few dinks. You're going to always catch fish, but quality fish gets a little tougher in September. Mm, yeah, no, 100%. And then let's see, got more questions here. Larry, how would you catch them this time of year then? I'm assuming what you mean is with the September turnover, um, since, you know, uh, Shane already went through his top baits this time of year. So strategy wise, forward facing sonar. I mean, honestly, that really does help because when those fish do start just chasing bait and they're not really locked onto a specific object, it, it, if you don't have forward facing sonar, I do think it's a lot tougher. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it helps. Um, but if you're talking about catching fish in the turnover while the fish are turning over, slow it down, small. Um, it may be time to do the finesse route if you, if you, uh, if they're, especially if you're just trying to find them. I don't know where he's at. Ashburn's north of here. So that turnover should be ending. But it's, it's really, you know, you got to find something small or something, you know, that they really want to key on on that lake and just slow it down to catch them during the turnover. No, no, 100%. Yeah, I, I had I had to fish a topwater tournament. It was a virtual all topwater. You could only fish topwater and register topwater fish um, when the turnover was going. I got lucky. <laughs> I won the tournament, but I got totally lucky because um, I caught one bass on the last day of the tournament. Uh, that was 19 and a half inches, and it was tough. It was really tough, but that turnover, it really slowed the fishing down for sure. 
Yeah, no, it, it really does. And, and guys, you know, again, you know, let me know in the comment section down below if there's any questions you have or anything that you want to you want to have answered today. Um, I'm going to be going until about probably four or five p.m. today. We'll have a couple of commercial breaks in there. So, and if, and if you don't listen right now, don't worry. I will chop this up into also a podcast episode too, so that you can listen later. Um, you know, Shane, you know, thank thank you so much. Is there anything that that yeah. we didn't go over today that we need to make sure we touch on? Uh, no, thanks, Thomas, for having me on. Um, and if anyone wants to, to uh, follow me on YouTube, I'm you know, Shane Flynn Outdoors on YouTube and on Facebook. Awesome, awesome. Well, sir, thank you so much. We're, we'll definitely try to link up uh, later on and do something else. Um, guys, Shane Flynn Outdoors, please give him a like and a follow. Really cool. Join one of his tournaments, and we'll see you later, bud. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Guys, there, there you have it. And so, yeah, again, if you guys are just tuning in right now, uh, this is we are celebrating Jake's Bait and Tackle's 10 year anniversary. They've been serving this community. Uh, we are located in Winchester, Virginia. I will be here all day live streaming. The event starts at 10 a.m. sharp, and we're going to be going all afternoon. We're going to have a ton of special guests actually on the show. I'm going to be uh, sending you the link actually to that. You know, I'm going to actually probably post this post this bad boy online but right now we're going to be we're going to be going over the flea market we're going to do local bait makers we are going to have jason halliker on of the department of wildlife resources he's going to be having an electric shock boat he is actually going to talk about the different fish and actually show off i believe some species that live in our local estuaries we're gonna have jeff little of, of torquedo he's going to be on the show as well we are going to have marty and his channel and he's going to talk about local bait makers in the greater frederick uh, dc metropolitan area so we're going to be talking about them as well we are also going to have on at some point jeff green of shallow water adventures jeff green will be on the show as well um and a bunch of different miscellaneous guests as, as well and again if you have any questions for me please drop them in the comment section below uh, we are going to take our first little break and we are going to be back at 10 a.m. We're going to be back at 10 a.m. to uh, start back up again. And I'm going to post in the comment thread here below the schedule. So that way, if there's a specific person that you want to listen to, you'll be able to listen to him as well. Again, this is Fishing the DMV. And yeah, we'll, uh, we're will we going to keep the live stream going and I will be back. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.